Hello, good evening, and welcome to this evening's debate organised by the Choosing Canada entitled Cycle Superhighway, a good or a bad thing for Chiswick. Uh, my name is Julian Warwick and my day job, or one of them at least, is as a broadcaster and journalist at the BBC on both television and radio. But I should point out that I have lived in four different addresses in Chiswick since 1994. Uh, this evening, uh, I knew the word small would not uh, apply to the size of the audience, so thank you all very much indeed for coming. Uh, these were, as you know, sought-after tickets. Um, I want to give you a sense of how the evening is supposed to work. In a moment, I'll introduce you to the four people who are sitting on the panel with me, who are representing different views on this subject. Uh, we'll start then talking in general terms about the idea, the background to it, the aims of it, uh, the broader concerns that might exist about it, and then at intervals, I'll bring in specific individuals who are sitting in these seats here. Uh, they've been invited to offer up their particular stories, concerns, expertise uh, relating to the current proposal. Uh, throughout the discussion, I want to give everybody in the room who wants to say something the chance to do that, so I will open it up to the audience as much as I possibly can. If in doing that I can ask for reasonably brief questions and comments. I know some of you here will have done a lot of detailed research into uh, elements of this plan, but you'll understand that if I want to bring many voices in, I need you to be reasonably succinct when you speak. Uh, and I also am aware from reading a lot of local press in recent weeks that there are some quite strong feelings on this particular issue. Um, but I'm keen for good humour to be maintained throughout. Um, I managed it at the EU debate just before the referendum happened, <laughs> so that should be a, a challenge that we can meet again this evening. I'm reminded of the former BBC Radio 4 controller by the name of Mark Damazon, who once said to me that he didn't much care for phone-in programmes, but he could tolerate them when they shed light rather than heat. And um, that's what we'll aim for tonight. <clears throat> Let me introduce you to the four people sitting here. In the order of them sitting away from me, this is Will Norman. Will is London's first walking and cycling commissioner, and Will's work prior to this includes trying uh, via various international organisations to tackle what's described as the global <coughs> activity crisis. Uh, Ruth Mayorkas is here. Ruth has lived in Chiswick for more than 40 years. Uh, she is a cyclist, although I, I believe you prefer the phrase person who cycles. Okay, we'll, we'll explore that at some point. Who lives just off the high road close to Gunnersbury Station. Uh, alongside Ruth is Caroline Raphael, who's another local resident, who lives just off the high road, but at the other end, closer to Stamford Brook Station. Uh, she doesn't cycle, but her son does. Is that the son? Okay. And at the far end of the line is David Lesniak, uh, with whom I've shared a panel before, actually, um, during a business rates event that we held at the Tabard Theatre. He is the co-owner of Outsider Tart on the corner of the high road and Chiswick Lane. And his brownies are very good. Um, let's talk about the big vision first of all. Will, what are we talking about? What is the cycle superhighway? Why is it going to come to Chiswick? So I'll start. Is this working? Good. Um, so I'm going to start talking. I'm going to start by just talking a bit about the London wide picture and why uh, and why we're talking about uh, cycle the highways. Why we're talking about any of this, uh, this this infrastructure and the changes that we are we're seeing in London. And I think it's worth. Um, reflecting on the changes that are coming up within London. We launched a, um, a mayor's transport strategy, not necessarily the most fascinating document in the world. There's, this is the summary version. The, uh, the thicker one is, the, the bigger one is much thicker. Um, I'm not sure, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you looked at it and some of you read it, but to summarize some of the changes that are, that are gonna happen in London coming up is that one is we're gonna see extraordinary population growth. Even the most pessimistic figures in terms of the growth in population over the, the terms of this strategy, which runs to 2040, we're talking about adding the population of Birmingham and Glasgow to the city uh, over that time period. 
So we're talking about a, 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 you know over a million people coming to what is already a busy city with no more road space. Um, despite the massive increase in investment in public transport, we're still talking about a significant uh, densification of London. At the same time, as, as Julian mentioned, we, we, like many cities around the world, we have an inactivity crisis. Only 50% um, of, well, less than 50% of Londoners are, are, are physically active doing 150 minutes uh, a, a, a week of, of, of physical activity, and 28% of Londoners don't even do that. Now, the implications to our health uh, uh, across the board are really significant in that. One of the most vague assessments show that that's going to cost the NHS 1.7 billion pounds in terms of uh, loading on cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, cancer. So we have an inactivity crisis. And then coupled with that, we have problems with air pollution, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and, uh, and, and these issues that we really need to change the way that we move around our city. Travel and the way we use our streets the way we use our public spaces are absolutely critical to driving a city which is healthier, which is cleaner, which is more successful economically. Um, so much of the 20th century saw London being redesigned around the car. And the legacy of that is that we have congested, polluted, dirty streets with high levels of road danger in some places uh, that really put people off and really disencourage people to think about using more active, more healthy, more sustainable modes of transport by walking, by cycling, by, by public transport. Um, so the aim, the sort of key number, the key, if you're going to read one thing in the Mayor's Transport Strategy, which is why we're doing this, is that we want to push well, the number of, uh, the percentage of people in London using walking, cycling and public transport from 64%, which we have today, to 80% by 2041. So that's a significant change in, in how we use our city. And all the evidence shows that if we are going to enable more people to walk and cycle, more, we need to make our seats, uh, streets safer for them to do that. We need to make sure that it is more appealing, it is more, it is more, it, the, the air is cleaner, the, uh, the streets are safer, the redu redu reduction in road danger to allow people to drive that change. So putting in new infrastructure is absolutely critical to that. There are, there are a variety of types of infrastructure that we need to see that, all of which are not just tackling a single mode. As Julian said, my job title isn't just cycling commissioner, it's the walking and cycling commissioner. I wouldn't have taken this job if it was just cycling. We're not talking about a single mode of transport. What I'm not interested in is getting men, middle-aged men in Lycra of sort of my, my stature and physique to cycle around our city in a faster way. I don't think anyone wants to see that, least of all <laughs> anyone with seeing me in Lycra doing that. This is about how do we make this active travel, walking to the bus stop, walking to the shops, not taking the car to do school runs, not doing drop-offs with the car, but walking, cycling, uh, making that normal not making it abnormal, and that's the impact, that's why we're driving this change of putting in new cycle routes, improving the facilities for pedestrians, of which this, uh, this route is an example. Right, let me, let me break that down, this is now working okay, isn't it? Um, I don't think many people in the room would argue with the wider aims you just outlined with reference to air pollution, congestion, population growth, although how do we know it's going to grow at that speed? Well, that's a, if we look at the economics of where we're going and in terms of the projected number of uh, jobs in London, the demography and where you're seeing growth, the number of houses that are being built, the growth areas of London, that's a conservative estimate. So, um, you know, there are, I think, you know, your previous debate maybe in Brexit might affect that at, at some level, but um, that's don't, taking in. Don't <laughs> let's go over there. I, I, don't want to I don't want to revisit that, that territory. Neither do I. But uh, we, we, you know, there are a number of economic projections and demographic projections that take into account yeah. new childbirths, school figures, all of that sort of thing, and, and we know that London's going to keep on growing. Right. So you've outlined why we need the concept of the cycling superhighway. Why does it need to come down the Chiswick High Road? But West London has no protected cycle routes at the moment, no major protected cycle routes that allow people to move through the city in a safe way, and not necessarily just the people who are moving at the moment, but attracting new people to move safe, safely through cycling. Uh, at the moment, that route along Chiswick High Street is about 3,000 uh, cyclists using that a day. 
I cycled down here today. I cycled from, I was in a meeting in Victoria, and I cycled down through uh, Hammersmith, uh, the Hammersmith Directory, along that road, along this road, and I saw nearly two, two collisions just in that one journey, yeah? I saw people weaving in and out of traffic, yeah? It, was un it is not the safest route for people to cycle along the road. At the moment, you've got high levels of cyclists using that route, and we know that there's demand for more people to cycle along that route, so we have to build safer facilities. There is a, you know, we've got high levels of collisions uh, along that route. Over the last three years on the Chiswick High Road alone, we've seen 87 different collisions uh, of both pedestrians and cyclists, some of which are, you know, some of which are slight. We need to improve the safety measures. So when you've got a busy route, congested with cars and other things, and you've got high levels of cycling, we need to protect people along that route to make it safer for both walking and cycling. Okay, well, one of the issues I don't doubt that will come up is to do with safety, and you've touched on a lot there, which we'll try and go into in, in greater depth as the evening goes on. Let me get a sense from the other three of you as to where you stand on this at the moment. Um, Ruth, um, you've lived here for many years. You're a cyclist or a person who cycles. Um, what do you think at the moment about this <coughs> idea of a cycle superhighway and the route it's taking through Chiswick? Am I on? You are on. You are on. Uh, yes, I have lived in Chiswick for 40 years, and when I moved here, my parents had already lived here in the 30s and the 40s, and Chiswick was a village, and people have commented on that, that it is a village. And the joy for me of cycling and cycling down the high road is that I meet people that I know, I can stop at any shop, I can stop at a shop. I did cycle with my child to school, either on the back of my bike or on the side. And I did it on roads where I had no protection whatsoever, but I did it and I've survived and I still cycle all the time. And I think it is a wonderful activity. I think that the best route is to go down the high road because we do need to encourage people to access the shops, we need people to access the local schools. And we know that so many of the journeys, I don't have the statistics, but I'm sure someone here can give them to you, are less than one and a half miles of, of, of driving, all of which are perfectly cyclable and walkable. I'm not saying they're not both. But it is important to make sure that the people who are less mobile actually can cycle. I have got a quote from uh, Isabel Clement from the Minister of Wellbeing, yep. which is, many disabled people cycle. For many of us, our cycle is our mobility and provides door-to-door -door transport, as well as a great way to exercise. Segregated cycle lanes are needed to enable more of us to cycle safely. She uses a wheelchair, I don't know if any of you know of her, but she uses a wheelchair indoors and out, and she has a handset that she then puts on to go further distances. So, you know, I think the, the point of cycling down the road is so many people are cut off by being inside a car. They don't meet each other, they don't talk to each other. When you sit at the cafes, you can barely hear each other think, let alone let alone speak. When I did used to walk my child to school, I couldn't hear him because, although I'm sure, he was even shorter. He used to shout at each other. I just think that we need to get out of the idea that Chiswick is a through route and focus on it being the village that it was, that I moved to in 1976, and that I've always cycled in and have had so much pleasure shopping at local shops, local stores, the vegetable store that I'm always having a chat with, no, it is really an important way of mixing the okay. society. Um, let me pursue the village idea, Caroline, with you, which I think is where you might take the argument, but perhaps <coughs> not necessarily in the same direction. Ruth, where, where do you stand on this? In many ways, the way in which you described Chiswick of 40 years in the village is, is the Chiswick that I think I live in now, and I've only been living here about 10 years. I think it's about 10 years. Um, but what I see is a... A high, uh, a high road that to a certain extent is our sort of village green, that it is full of people walking down it, talking, <coughs> meeting, stopping with their scooters, and that's probably a subject for another night, uh, small children on scooters, or with their dogs running, indeed disabled people using the pavements which they can, whether they should or not is another issue because of the width of it. But I see a place where, and I walk down it virtually every day, so I see absolutely a thriving village, people stopping and starting. And my worry is, um, and I also I think have your new app, your your so I'm a great walker, I believe in walking. 
Um, but what I actually see when I look at those plans is, is a structure, is an infrastructure that's going to kind of fracture our community here. That will almost split the library in half. The very thing which which you appreciate as well. So we obviously want the same things, um, but we feel we get them or may get them in very different ways. So you both love the village idea, but you think this would be fragmented <coughs> and you think it would be enhanced? Well, currently I think it's divided by, particularly on Sunday, it's, it's a gridlock traffic jam from beginning to end, where crossing the road is incredibly yeah. 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 And I also think. Mike Moran, who I don't know if Mike's here, but he uh, runs the dry cleaner in um, <coughs> Devon's Road, and we have many conversations about the ability to get up there. He, even he said to me that he has a friend who's in a wheelchair, who at the bottom end of Devon's Road, as in the third closest to the A4, has to decide whether he wants to be on the left or the right before he can go down it, because once he's on it, he's committed to one side or the other, and the same with Turner Green Terrace. You have to decide at the traffic lights at the junction with the high road, do you want to be on the left, or do you want to be on the right? You cannot cross it till you get down to the station. I think we have, like Chiswick now is divided, the A4 is, as we all know, is a real problem for dividing it, and if we could reduce the amount of cars through, if we could reduce the rat running, the Uber, the private hire vehicles, then we could have a much more sense of community where people can breathe clean air. Okay. Uh, David, where do you stand? Yeah. That wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be in a moment. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, like Caroline, I've lived in Chiswick about 10 years now. Uh, we also have a shop that's about 10 years old as well. Um, I understand the village aspect of it, but what I don't understand is it's not an isolated village out in the middle of nowhere. It's a piece of a bigger city. And as such, it is connected to that, like it or not. And from a business point of view, as well as a residential point of view, loading and unloading will be eliminated on the south side. So exactly how are the businesses supposed to get supplies? How are they supposed to prepare those meals that you like? How, how are you supposed to move house if you want? That cannot, it can no longer happen. So it's a piece of a larger supply chain. We have no control over that. If I order something from a supplier, I'm now in their hands. There's only so much I can do to say, oh yeah, by the way, and I'm trying to get some responses from those folks as to what, what are the options. I don't know that there are any, really. Um, and along those lines as well, the conversion of these single yellows to double yellow, that has to do with parking. So I understand the incentive that the city has. I understand that people want to bike and live healthier lifestyles, but Cars aren't going anywhere. In fact, cars are being converted to electric at an alarming rate. So suddenly, all of those parking spaces that people do enjoy will be gone. So you look at the hospitality businesses in particular, you look at the high road after 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, and the high road is packed. I'm not saying that's a great thing, but it's good for business. And if you eliminate it, what's going to happen to that, what's going to happen to your life for some people who rely upon that as an means <coughs> of transit? David, I'm going to talk more about business aspects a little bit later on, so I'll bring you back in on that. And there are one or two other business forces to bring into the mix as well. Can I, at this stage, just get some general, and I stress general observations from the audience, because we are going to go into some of the specifics, <coughs> but a few comments now would help us along. Yes, sir. Um, touching on a couple of things that Chisley could say. One talks about the village view of Chiswick. I'll remind people that the village of Chiswick started near St. Nicholas's Church. And we're talking also about fracturing by a cycle super highway. The village of Chiswick is fractured from the rest of Chiswick by the A4. Yes, sir. Um, so I've lived in Chiswick for 20 years. I'm a commuter cyclist. I've probably notched near 100,000 cycling miles. 
I'm against cycle superhighways. The devil is in the title. They are unsafe. And when you talk about safety, you must think about cyclists and, and the risks they face from other cyclists. They're the most dangerous people we have to face. It's the culture of well, teaching the cyclists how to cycle well. I'm about to raise the issue of the title, so I'm glad you've got there before I did. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. On this gentleman's comment about cycling, we're talking about walking as well. Very important point. Everything that you've said, sir, is absolutely right from a bigger holistic point of view. From a Chiswick point of view, it would be a disaster. And if anyone thinks that it will reduce the traffic in the high street on the face of every solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, secondly, yeah. I have an eight-year-old. I've lived in Chiswick 10 years. Will I put my eight-year-old on that highway? Absolutely not. I have a lovely little wire dash, and we take a walk every day. That's healthy for you. Within the district of that Chiswick, there is no point in cycling because if you do want to cycle, you can on the pavements with a reason. Some of the children, but some of the local areas that you can cycle are, are there for you if you want to. But to walk, if you do a super highway, is this going to bring business to Chiswick? Uh, which some people have said, again, this illusion, it's not. It's going to be a throughway at speed, mm -hmm. at speed, and highly dangerous to families. And children and babies will come here to Thank you. Yes, here, I totally agree with the aim set out by CS9 and by the Mayor's Draft Policy. However, I think as residents, we need to hold up the scrutiny at whether the CS9 actually does what you say it's going to do. I've had a look in detail, and I cannot see how it's going to discourage commuters in cars from using it as a through route. I can't see how we're going to encourage more pedestrians because you're taking from the pavements rather than the roads. There are typical examples right at the beginning of Chiswick High Road and at the end of Chiswick High Road where you're reducing the pavements by over three quarters by where we live and two thirds at the other end. And where we live, you are getting rid of a bus lane, a, 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 an inadequate cycle lane, yet still handing that over to motorists. So I love, I love your aim, but would question how this is going to make Okay, thank you. What? One, more. <laughs> one, one more at this stage, and then I will come back to you, Reggie. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, you, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, yeah I just wanted to. Um, Someone mentioned kind of culture in the unsafe cyclists. Um, I would also probably describe myself as a cyclist. I lived here for about 10 years. I actually cycle along the obstacle roads uh, in the central town. Um, I cycle relatively fast um, because I have to to feel safe with the traffic, to be honest. I cycle with a, a newbie sometimes, and going slow is terrifying. Um, and I think you get a lot of fast cyclists on the road. But I think that is because that is the infrastructure that is there for them or not there. Yeah, yeah. I think if we want to encourage safe cycling, so to speak, we need to give people an environment in which they will feel safe. Yeah. Um, and therefore... <laughs> okay. I'm going to come back to the audience and regular interval, rest assured. Why are you calling it a super highway? <coughs> the, uh, the, the cycle superhighway brand pre pre uh, exists before I decided uh, this job, and I think I personally prefer the idea of a cycle route. So um, Boris Johnson's for that. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't allocate any particular. I think we're talking about a, a cycle route here. The, the imagery of a cycle superhighway, of I said, those people cycling very fast, dressed in lycra, is not necessary. It's certainly not what we're trying to achieve here. But how and do you actually, show that particular group of people partaking of it? I'll come to that. So um, in terms of uh, the what the evidence shows, and I was uh, watching uh, and talking to some cyclists, some first pe people who hadn't cycled before, who had been using some of the seg segregated and protected lanes that exist in central London, so going across Blackfriars Bridge, going along the embankment. <coughs> And what they are saying is actually, no, this is exactly what I want to do. I met a, book, a family who were using a, who was out there with a group of kids. You mentioned your eight-year-olds. When it's fully protected, protected cycling routes away from uh, fully segregated, it is as big.
it feels and it uh, and it gives that uh, and, it, and it gives greater protection for people to try cycling in new spaces and to and to and to and to bring new people in. In terms of cyclist behaviour, you know, the, this I, I agree with the gentleman over there that so many cyclists cycle fast because they feel they have to. They have to feel that they have to keep up with the speed of traffic because they don't have adequate protection across all of London. So therefore, and what the evidence shows is when you put in the safer infrastructure and you make it safer for cycling and you protect them from that, they don't have to keep up with that speed of traffic, then they slow down. We diversify the types of people cycling and we diversify <coughs> and we drop the speed. In addition to that, we have a team of people for working with the Metropolitan Police who enforce uh, uh, road traffic behavior. When we put in new cycle routes, we will make sure that that group comes along and enforces that. Last year, they gave out 2,000 different tickets to cyclists who were doing being behavior. But what was interesting, that there were far more people from driving cars who were uh, committing road traffic offenses than the cyclists. There were 53% of them driving cars. <laughs> Can I just pick you up on the word uh, diversify? Because given that this, it's obviously a two-lane uh, highway that we're talking about, but it's not vastly wide. So the point I'm getting at is that you can only diversify to a degree, because if there are a lot of cyclists traveling along it at the same time, realistically, you can only go at the speed that the slowest cyclist is going at, surely. Julian. <coughs> yeah. Can I just take up that point about cycling over Blackfriars Bridge? I've, I've cycled over Blackfriars Bridge on a Boris bike. Uh, I tell you, I cycle around Bo uh, central London on a Boris bike. I'm perfectly happy cycling uh, 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 in, in all other roads. The one place I felt the most unsafe uh, was on uh, Blackfriars Bridge in the, in, in the segregated lanes. I've never felt more terrified than this, the, these, these uh, cyclists who, as you rightly say, are pushing you to go faster than you want to go. I mean, it is, it is a highly, yeah. dangerous, uh, well, highly dangerous route. What of the point they just made, that part of the reason that they are going as fast as they are, is to preserve themselves in the fast-moving traffic? No, it's, they're not in against any other traffic than themselves. It's a segregated lane. It's a, cycle, it's a cycling lane. I see what you mean. It's a cycling yeah. lane. Yeah, OK. I mean, this, I don't know if anybody can see this, but this is me. This is how I cycle. And I cycle about 150 miles a week. The cycle behaviour, as has been described, has built up in London. It wasn't like this in the 70s. I cycled to work every day in the 70s. We didn't call it commuting, we cycled to work. And I cycled alongside men and women who were in their suits, in their skirts, in their high heels, going into the city. I was going up to North Acton, to Ealing, and what have you. Cycle behaviour has changed because of the speed of traffic. And I think what you all forget, we all forget it, is cars are so much bigger now, cars are so much faster now, they're soundproof, they've got suspension. People drive much quicker than they did. And people who are on a bike often, I mean, I cycle all the way out to Windsor a couple of times a week. We go through Heston, we go through all these areas with no cycle routes whatsoever. And sometimes we do have to cycle a bit faster because otherwise it is very dangerous and not very pleasant. The point about Cycle Super Highway, I hate the name, he knows I hate the name, is that over time it will change. And during the day, when they are used by families and children, then it is a marvellous way for people to get around, to get to school, to get to the shops, and to have a different view of life. And I know, I mean, I walk hundreds of miles a year as well. But often there's that bit further where you want to carry a bit more shopping, or there's a bit further for your child to be able to walk. As I say, my son was on the back of my bike, and then alongside me. I used to have to cycle along Chiswick High Road with him on the pavement, and I used to have to watch out for every single side turn to yeah. keep an eye on him. So we just have to change. And we so just come back to Will on that diversity. No, I, 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 heard, I heard somebody say, answer the question, which is probably my fault. Sorry, it's not. No, 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 it's fine. It's my fault. Um, how, do you, how do you determine who uses this at any given moment, who therefore doesn't necessarily determine the speed that everybody else goes at. Mm. <laughs> what, what I want to achieve here in London is a cultural change. I want to make cycling normal, I want to get people to be thinking about wearing normal clothes, jeans, shirts, whatever people want, I'm not going to dictate that. But we need to change this shift, this, this culture, and I think 
putting in safer infrastructure is absolutely critical. And I've got the evidence to, to prove that. We did some monitoring on the high quality cycling routes in Camden around Royal College Street, where set cyclists are segregated from the traffic. And I'm not going to, and I'm not going to deny that there are some aggressive cyclists out there that push people and, uh, are, and, are, and are abusive to people in the way. I'm, I'm not done, not, not denying that, but they are a minority. And I think by putting in the better infrastructure, we can change that so that they're even more of a minority and change that pressure. But the evidence shows in Camden that when you put that in, we've already seen an increase of 10% more women cycling along those routes. We've diversified the age range where a higher proportion of younger people, higher proportion of older people were. We even did a camp looking at what people wear and the diversification in terms of moving away from Lycra and some neon clad uh, speed demon to people wearing normal clothes. Now, I'm not quite sure what normal clothes are. I didn't do the study. But the 16% shift when you put in that safer infrastructure is absolutely critical. Right, I'm That's one road. We need to be thinking about this across the whole okay. city. Two, two more quickly from the audience, and Carol, I'll bring you in a moment. Yes, you, you caught my eye a moment ago. Um, I, I arrived late, so I don't know whether this is being covered, but could I just ask, there's a very poor pavement that runs from Hammersmith to, to the roundabout next to the A4, and yes. nobody walks along it. So why can't <laughs>
Um, and I come back to the real concerns about what I believe are called uncontrolled crossings. For some, uh, for over a year, I spent some of my working life working for Penguin Random House, and I was in their Vauxhall building. And every day we stepped out of that building onto um, what was an uncontrolled crossing. In fact, it was, a, it was also a shared area of which there appeared to be at least two. Uh, according to, if I'm reading the maps, on these proposals, you mean, on these yes. proposals, yes. I have to say, leaving that building to go to the uh, traffic lights to cross the road to get to Pimlico <coughs> was terrifying. Um, I don't think the cyclists were necessarily going very fast. I think they were probably very responsible. So, so my son lives in that area, he's a cyclist, and in many ways, I'm for this, these highways but not in suburban residential okay. areas. I think there are a couple of areas where we were, and the other the last one, is standing in, in a very small strip of pavement, possibly with people, with small children, or with buggies, waiting for buses, trying to cross the okay. highway. Um, David, a quick thought. Just a bit of sort of combining something you said, yeah. Caroline said. I don't understand if you're talking about everyone using the cycle superhighway simultaneously. So we have parents with little toddlers getting doing their school run, as well as people getting to the city during rush hour. And one of the other things I don't get is the physical condition of the embankment versus Chiswick High Road. It's a much tighter area. The cycle lane, as I understand it, isn't going to be nearly as wide for different types of cyclists with different styles or ages or capabilities to pass one another. This, to me, is what you're saying. It's like, how is it regulated? Who uses it when? And if you're caught behind two kids going to school, what are you supposed to do? Right, let me bring some, some voices in down here. And I know there are plenty of people who want to have their say, and I will come back to you all because I can see so many hands. But, um, uh, let me bring in Paul Pierce, who's sitting down here uh, in at our front rows. Paul is a local journalist. He also happens to be Caroline's husband. So we want you know, a degree of openness in this conversation. Um, <clears throat> I know you've been looking at this fairly closely, Paul. What, what conclusions do you come to? Well, um, as, as a resident, I went back to um, GFL's own documents to try and find out why they were imposing this particular type of cycle superhighway on us, as opposed to other segregated cycle paths and routes and so on. Um, and they, they produced a document called the London Cycling Design Standards, uh, which set out the requirements and advice for cycle network planning. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to go back to a couple of points from this. Um, primarily the application of street types, in which their document says, the concept of street types can serve as a proxy for considerations of use and place. High streets, for example, are likely to see high levels of curbside activity and much more complex patterns of pedestrian movement than other streets. As a consequence, they produce a grid showing the use of different types of cycle routes on different types of road. So a completely segregated cycle route of the type that they're proposing for us, for instance, is used on an arterial road or connectors to arterial roads. Whereas if it's a side residential street, there's complete integration with other vehicles. There are no cycle segregated paths. The segregation that's recommended in their own document for a high street are mandatory or advisory lanes which are painted onto the road, which are not separated by bricks or raised areas. Those are for arterial roads with their kind of heavy traffic. Indeed, it says later on in their document, the model of using segregated two-way tracks on one side of the street should be applied very selectively. They have four opportunities where they should be used where buildings, active uses, and side roads are entirely or largely on one side, which doesn't apply to our high road, where curbside activity may be reconfigured so as to take place largely on one side, doesn't apply to our high road, arterial roads, such as wide dual carriageways with infrequent crossings, which I think applies to the A4, but not to our high road, and one-way systems and gyrators, 
which is not our high road. So by their own documentation, this type of segregated two-lane cycle track is inappropriate for a high street with our kind of pedestrian and retail activity on both sides of the road. Paul, can I just bring in a response to that? some response to that, but I know there are colleagues of yours down here who might want to add to that as well. But a first reaction to what you've heard. Certainly, I, well, I would certainly say painted, painted routes on a road such as the, the, the high road out here would offer no protection at all for cyclists and not something that they want to Two-way tracks require less overall space, uh, which would be more, uh, more, um, more space left for pavements and for uh, other traffic there. Um, one of the key things around the two-way tracks is also it generally allows for more parking and loading, which is useful in this context as well. Um, I'm not a cycle designer. Uh, I'm going to pass over to one of my colleagues who is, who can actually go through this more detail. But one thing I would say, the clue is also in, in the title of this, in terms of it is guidance, it isn't necessary, the full, the full rules, and I would certainly hand over to Joy to, to, to talk a bit more about that. Okay, well, let me bring in... Uh, can I just come briefly, if you would? Um, actually, it says in here, it, it's not just guidance, it has to be adhered to in order to achieve funding. Um, so perhaps it's achieved funding through another route. The document ends with a statement of general principle, it is not desirable to take space from pedestrians to provide for cycling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can pass your microphone across to Joy. Um, Joy Wink is here, senior sponsor at, at TFL. I was going to ask Joy a little bit about the A4 in a moment to um, go back to where you were at that, but do you want to deal with the points that Paul was made first? Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. So, happy to deal with points around uh, <coughs> the cycling design standards and the points around the A4. Can't hear you. Yeah, not if you hold it, hold it a little closer. closer. How's this? Is it anything coming through now? No. 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 How's this now? Any better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, coming through. Great. All right. No, 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 no. Closer. Um, Closer. Um, <laughs> dear, 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 try not to eat this mic. Stand on the stage. Tell you what, use that one for the time being. Okay. See if that helps. Thanks. Cheers. I don't know who wants this. Right. <laughs> <there. laughs> Um, I think Will's covered off pretty much everything I would want to say on the London Cycling Design Standards. They are guidance documents. Um, I think the gentleman to my right overlooked the point where they suggest that, two, that segregated cycling is also suitable in high road scenarios, where we decide where to, what type of infrastructure is most appropriate for a road. We assess the traffic volumes. Um, certainly traffic volumes on Chiswick Road are high, or on Chiswick High Road are high enough to warrant full separation for cyclists. So like Will was saying, if you were to just paint some lanes on the road, that wouldn't offer the type of protection for cyclists that we would look for here. Okay, um, what? I also wanted to ask you, Joy, while you're here, and I know alongside you is Mark Frost, who's the head of traffic and transport at the London Borough of Hounslow, um, because the point was raised about the A4. Why not take a cycle superhighway Alongside the A4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give, uh, I'll give Joy a break and beat this microphone for a bit. Um, so I'm Mark Frost, I'm the head of traffic and transport at the London Borough of Hounslow. Um, the borough has enthusiastically supported the Cycle Superhighway uh, when it was announced in 2008, and again in 2010, and again in 2012, and again now. Uh, we want to improve the facilities for cyclists in our borough, we particularly want to improve the facilities for cyclists link our town centres. We want cycle facilities in places where people uh, want to go to. Uh, I don't know many people who want to go to the A4, um, so I don't think that's really the solution. <laughs> it needs to be very careful what you wish for. So to provide for a segregated cycle facility on the A4, uh, everyone sits there and points at the various uh, tracks that are there at the moment and says, oh look, there's one, so that's fine, isn't it? Um, but of course, they all give out at the side roads. And what would have to happen at all of those side roads is that time would have to be given to cyclists at every single side road along the A4, which of course is a huge and massive delay 
for traffic that would be going up and down the A4. And what happens when one road slows down is that people try and find other routes. And the route that they would find would be Chiswick High Road. So everybody would be over here trying to avoid the traffic that would be on the, uh, the, on the A4. Um, we also know that people who use the A4 tend to be making longer trips, which is used obviously by a lot of freight, logistics, and longer distance commuters. These are journeys that are probably far less likely to be suitable to be made by bike. Whereas the trips that are made to the high road, yes, many people do need to drive here potentially, but there are also many people that make short trips by car, and it's that trip, those trips that we wish to uh, try and encourage more of those people to make trips on two wheels. But you need to know uh, where these cyclists are going before you can be quite so clear about the rights and wrongs of that route. Surely, if they are passing through, if you want these people to go significant distances on their bicycle, then no, it's, it's, it's a more appropriate place to have it. With respect, you're thinking about cyclists again as there's some other group. Uh, these are people that travel around London. Some people travel by bike, some by foot, some by bus or whatever. People travel to the high road. People want to come here. I like coming here. Lots of people like coming here. But people don't like coming here by bike because it's not a very nice place to get to by a bike. So we know that if we make it nicer to travel by bike, more people will travel here by bike. Yeah. That cannot be said at the end of the day. <laughs> One of, one of the other challenges with the A4 is around connectivity of how you get on and off that route and how you get to crossing six lanes of busy traffic to get from one side to the other going via subways is not particularly appealing for, for, for cyclists as well. So I think coming back to one of the concerns that David rose earlier on, that we know that when cyclist, uh, faci cycling facilities goes into an area, we see an uplift in footfall and, um, and, and, and improvements to business spending in those areas. Not being able to get on and off the A4 in that one way would reduce okay. those benefits in terms of the economics as well. Um, specifically on the A4, there was a hand raised a moment ago. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, in terms of who would come out of Chiswick High Road, there's a Chiswick Park at the end of it. It's quite a large business park, and thousands of people work there. I've worked there for the last five years. I come by bike out of necessity coming to the um, park from South London. So you, you're, you're in favour of the high road option rather than the A4 option. It doesn't go to Chiswick Park. Well, yeah. no, yes, you're right. It does go down Wesley <coughs> Road. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't go to, and we recognise it doesn't go to uh, Chiswick Park. And I know that that's a significant employer in the area and a, a lot of people are going to get there. We haven't removed the access to the business, uh, to the business park for, for cycles and the connections are still available with, through, the, through the local roads, but granted they won't be fully why segregated. Why does it not go to Chiswick Business Park? What's the reason? It would be a great place to end a cycle lane, wouldn't it? Uh, because we also want that cycle lane to continue on through to... Uh, oh, sorry, it, 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 it goes down Heathfield and peters off like a dodgy 1980s album. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's truly true. Sure. It, it really is truly yeah, true. Sure, I'm familiar with that album. <laughs> Let's just get some clarity to that before we um, before we move on. The route diverts off the high road at Wellesley Road, goes south, goes south of Turnham Green, and then takes you along Wellesley Road. Does it not? There are a number of reasons. So there are a number of reasons for that alignment. Uh, one of the uh, uh, reasons, and I think the key reason here is it provides a more direct route for uh, people going through to Chiswick, Cubridge Station, Brentford, and Brentford to Chiswick. Um, it also has an impact in terms of buses, general traffic, parking and loading, and some of the constraints in that area. So, so you're, it's a decision. you're prioritising motor vehicles again, are you? Over, yeah. um, I've had my no. hand up for ages. Can I speak? Uh, you can. I'll come to you <laughs> first, and then I'll go over there. Yes. Thank you. I have a number of points to make. First of all, in the area of the whole of Chiswick, it's being, um, the speed limits are being reduced to 20 miles per hour. How are we going to... Um, supervise that the bicycles retain, keep within this 20 mile an hour speed. There is no way of controlling that. <laughs> Secondly, always, always pay, always funding, always funding this super highway. How is it being paid for? Is it the, the, the traffic? Is it the, the, the road, the car drivers, the vehicle drivers? 
And thirdly, we were just on the Wellesley Road in the style of garden things. Yep. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous that both those roads, which give access for local residents to the, Chis the lower end of Chiswick High Road, the yep. lower the Chiswick Land Road, should be shut off. One, fine. But if both are shut off, the residents of Stylehall Gardens, and I am not one, will have to go all the way back to Oxford Road North, up onto Chiswick High Road, and come around and circle. Now tell me how green that is. I, I'm going to put that point specifically, okay. because we have somebody sitting near me yeah. who is that, a resident of Stylehall Gardens. Absolutely, yeah. I'm glad you've made it. Yes, you, 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 you caught Hi, that out. Okay. I've lived in Chiswick since the very early 70s, in the same house on Chiswick High Road, flat on Chiswick High Road. Um, cyclists, me, are an absolute nightmare. They don't stick to the road, they stay on the pavement. So if this cycle superhighway goes ahead, is there a guarantee that the pro-cycling people on the stage begin to ensure that cyclists stay on the highway and not run me and my dogs over and almost Thank, thank you for the point. I'm going to bring in, if I may, uh, at this point, Michael uh, Robinson, because Michael's a member of the Hounslow Cycling Campaign. Oh, I forgot to add one thing. <laughs> <laughs> really important, Ruth, why are you sneaking around handing out pro cycling leaflets? How will Walsh leave up? Well, you know, let's, let's, let's put that to one side. Sorry, I'll have to get back in. Okay, yeah, I'll come to you in a moment. Rest assured. Michael Robinson, uh, member of the Household Cycling Campaign. Have we still got a microphone that works? This part of the line? This one? Hello? No, this one didn't work. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Where do you, where do you normally cycle? Sorry, this doesn't work. Does this work? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, I thought it was um, Stalhall Gardens residents' perspective. I've, I've lived there for 20 years. Um, we've recently done measurements on traffic speed on Stalhall Gardens. 83% of cars exceed 20 miles an hour. 85% of cars, uh, are, 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 sorry, 15% of cars exceed 30 miles an hour. 1% of cars exceed 40 miles an hour. And this is a 20 mile per hour limit. So obviously it's the irresponsible majority of drivers that are given the responsible minority of bad name. So, <laughs> so, so the other issue on South Hall Gardens and Wellesley Road is not just excessive speed breaking the speed limit, it's also the gridlock that happens lots of evenings when uh, drivers who are following Google Waze app and see they can get 30 seconds faster journey from Hammersmith to Reading by going down those roads and therefore blocking up the end of the road. So from a, from a resident's perspective, I mean, I don't speak to all residents, but the consultation we had last year demonstrated that the majority of residents in those roads want the access shut. And I mean, the people who are most in favor of it are parents with young families who value a safer and quieter road for their children rather than saving four minutes on a journey. Um, what about the point raised over there? <laughs> Close off that particular access to the South Circular Road, the route that you and others would then have to take to get back to the Chiswick High Road can, can would I, be a rather lengthy one. Can well, I just well, again, if, again, I we, said there yeah, are two roads. Yeah, no, no, there and the other Wellesley one. Road and, and they're closing road. both. Yeah. And closing both yes. is better. I completely agree with the resident of Style Hall with what he's saying, but Wellesley Road should be. Right, okay. Sure. Well, well, again, the problem with just closing one is it makes the other one even worse. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's obvious. And I mean, in terms of the, the additional journey time, again, one of our residents last year kind of said, okay, well, what's life like if the road's closed? And for a week, actually used Oxford Road North, Chiswick High Road for a journey. And she measured the average time as four minutes. The worst time was 10 minutes. And as a family, with young children, she thought, well, that's worth it to have a quieter and safer road for me and my family. Can I just raise the point, Will, with you on, on the impact that that specific change will have on the overall traffic numbers? Because clearly one of the aims of the exercise that you outlined at the start is that you want to bring down the number of road vehicles in Chiswick. But if you live in Style Hall Gardens or Wellesley Road, you then have to take a much more long, drawn-out route to get to the Chiswick High Road. Won't that add to congestion at that western end of the Chiswick High Road? 
I'd love to answer that if I had a microphone. <laughs> Fantastic. Hello, uh, great. So um, just picking up on that point specifically, up to 75% of the vehicles traveling through that residential area is non-residential traffic. So we're taking out the, the rat running, people cutting through these areas because they don't want to go on, 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 on the main arterial route. So by changing the design of those roads, we would actually reduce the number of people going up and down those routes. There are a couple of other things that I just wanted to touch on that got raised that we didn't, yep. didn't address, unless, unless you might be able to say anything else on the, the work. Um, certainly, somebody mentioned around the 20 mile an hour zone, uh, and, and um, I just want to re-emphasize why that is so important. And it comes back to a point that the gentleman down here picked up on earlier on in terms of just the physics of being hit by a vehicle. Um, if someone is hit by a vehicle doing 30 miles an hour, they have an 80% 80 chance of being killed. If they hit a if, they, if someone is hit by a vehicle doing 20 miles an hour, they have a 10% chance of being killed. The impact on road safety is phenomenal in terms of driving that change. Not many cyclists do 20 miles an hour unless uh, in London. In, 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 in but I come back to the point that I mentioned earlier on, that when we put in this new infrastructure, we will have enforcement teams on the ground making sure that uh, cyclists do adhere to it. Right. Can I just, can I just pick you up on that point? Uh, how many? How often will they be there? How visible will they be? Because there's clearly a lot of scepticism in the room as to how much enforcement there will actually be in practice. So we have a team of officers who will be there. We tend to deploy them, obviously that, that team of officers working with the Met are deployed all over the city according to need. The need... <laughs> pardon? Officers? There, How big is the team? There is a team of 33 officers doing it. Officers? Yeah. But the point of the done. For, um, in terms of the site that we fund, in terms of the cycling, there are more officers in terms of the local borough officers who will be working on this. No, that's My right. point. And this, it's true. It's true. Um, and I've been it's out with them. Well, even 20 mile an hour speed limit, police will not enforce. I'm not. Talk, I'm talking about the. We're talking cycling. I'm talking about the cars. They were enforcing the cars. Okay. Okay. Let's so let's let's do it. <laughs> let me come on. Let me come on. Let me come on to that point. But. In terms of the enforcement, we will target those people so there will be visible officers when people are on these new routes. And what we find is when people are targeted to begin with, it changes the behavior with the new infrastructure going in. If there are problems and if there are issues being coming up from the community that you feel that are an issue, we will put those enforcement officers back in those areas. They will be highly visible and they do make a difference. Okay, a um, gentleman at the back there called my eye, yes. Uh, uh, nice morning, Chili Paul and Fred. Um, I cycle five days a week, three days up to the West End, two days a week out to, to Heathrow. Um, and I think we've let these guys dismiss the cycle path alongside the A4 much too easily. There's two fatuous comments about why we can't have it. I, I was shaking my head, I didn't believe either of the comments about why we can't have it. There was a cycle path alongside the A4 from Chiswick Roundabout out to Heathrow. Yeah. So, so you can have a slide path, although it's the man to the hand it is the worst maintained in the ground. So you can have a slide path outside the airport, um, and so there is no reason we can't have a slide path. I do both kinds of cycling. And the Met will, you dismiss the idea that there are two kinds of cycling. I cycle around Shizit gently, I'm here tonight on my bike, I cycle with my family. That's a very different kind of cycling to what I do. But I'm heading to Heathrow or West End. Can I just pick you up on why that cycle path that you described in the terms you did, why is it quite as bad oh, as you yeah, say? Yeah, uh, uh, three reasons. It's, it's potholed and badly maintained. It drives you into bus stops, and there's, there's at least three or four occasions where it dead ends you into the road. Um, so I would like any, any cycle uh, designer to be forced to ride at the route with a GoPro on his head and explaining what he's thinking when he's designed these things. Right. <laughs> 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 there are numerous times cycling to Heathrow on that cycle path where you think, what the bloody hell was this man thinking? Can, can Mike Frost, can Mike Frost <laughs> answer that point? We need dismiss two kinds of cycling. We need less traffic in Chiswick. We need better family and leisure cycling, gentle cycling. In, in Chiswick, we also need the ability to get up to the West End very quickly on bikes, and the A4 is perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
know if you wanted to reply to that specifically, and then I'll come to you two gentlemen over there. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I have got, actually, I think, am I working? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, there's kind of three issues. There's the A4 and the A4. The A4 that you're describing absolutely has to be upgraded. It was built in the 30s. It is a fantastic route. And we've all been asking from household cycling repeatedly for it to be upgraded. And it's a win-win for that one. The A4 that we're sort of talking about as an alternative to the high road, though, is the A4 that runs from Sutton Court Road going east. So I think we do have to divide the bits of the A4 in that sense. Okay. Two, uh, another thing is, I find it very extraordinary that people have a real disconnect about speed and danger. The corner of where the Crown and Anchor and Starbucks that goes up to Belmont Road. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure is that Belmont Road or the Road. Well, I, well, I, you know, I cycle where I walk everywhere, and I've been on crutches in Chiswick quite frequently because I have foot surgery. Drivers drive at you on that junction. They do not stop, they do not give way, and yet everybody seems to accept that that's acceptable. I don't understand that. We are also looking to future proof. This is not for t tomorrow. This is for the fact that I don't know about anyone in this room, but my son, who's 25, does not drive. He can't afford a car in London. He can't really afford car insurance. We're looking long term, and if you look at the north and the east and the south of London, young people very rarely own cars, and future children and young <coughs> people. And I've been canvassing in the street a lot on turning green, green, and I've spoken to a lot of young families who cycle everywhere, and they want their children to cycle safely. We have to be looking long term, not just now for you. And finally, yeah. sorry, Kingston Market. If you go to Kingston Market, where it's shared use, Initially, there were a few TV problems. It's fabulous. People cycle with respect. People walk with respect. Everyone enjoys it. It's a very, very busy, lovely heart of Kingston. No one would dream of putting cars back to there. Uh, That's what we need. Did you want to deal with your leaflet? Well, it wasn't meant to be sneaky at all. Just it was with six websites, which would give more information about things like Wheels for Wellbeing, um, the pollution statistics, what the mayor is doing, right. and various Guardian okay. articles. If I was out of hand, I do apologise. There you are. We, we've had the answer to that. There were two hands there. I'll briefly both, if you would, and then I'm going to come to some more people down here. Yeah. So, all right. Two, I think the, to use, to appear to use the cycle, which I approve of, the cycle, superhighway, as a weapon to solve fabric, uh, a traffic problem in wealthy road areas, instead of taking the obvious employment path. Um, at Chiswick Park, it's not a good reason for using the cycle path. We're sending it through Wealthy Road. We yeah. use it as a, as a deterrent for cars. It's got to be going to the right place, yeah. and it should be there. Mm -hmm. My other more important point was, when you have a two-lane, which we have, the proposal is a two-lane through Chiswick High Road. Yes. Both up and down cyclists are using yeah. the same piece of tarmac. The issue of, that this gentleman brought up about um, Blackfriars Bridge, you've got it twice over. And for those of you who are cyclists, obviously I've heard some of you speak, are you going to feel secure about people coming this way? Absolutely. You're going that way, way. Uh, with nothing between you? I sense a hand prepared to answer that. So, yes, but the, south, the north side has no cycle lane. No, no, so, no. those of us like me who neighbourhood cycle, I'm going to be cycling on the north side as well mm -hmm. in the right. traffic. Uh, I take you across. Yeah, you want to watch that specifically. I ride on cycles with the highways every day. I take the longer roads because I live quite far. I, I, I've been working with Jason for the last oh, almost 10 years. 16 years, I've been coming on my bike. I go to Chiswick to to your coffee shop, great sausage rolls. I bring my bike to the shop. I mean, Chiswick Highway is dangerous, and I and I felt it. And I cycle on cycle super highways. There are two ways. No one I've never seen. I, I've heard about crashes. I've never seen one. Whenever there are kids on cycle cycle super highway, everyone slows down. Everyone slows down and takes them like this really carefully because kids are unpredictable and you don't want to crash into a kid. You do it slowly. Okay. You do. Thank you, Will. <laughs>
surely, if you look at the A4 and go to a decent option or alternative, surely if you're spending all that money, you can actually work out how to get bikes across the A4 or under the A4. Mm -hmm. It's very disingenuous when you see all the brain power that's going into the single scheme. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The other thing, sorry, Please very quickly, yep. uh, answer from either Will, I think it is, or Mark. Uh, when the proposal came forward for closing up Star Hall and, and, and Wellesley, uh, we were told TfL was doing planning <coughs> uh, modelling on the impact on that and traffic in, uh, in the area. Yep. Um, if that's been published, I've missed it. Okay, well I'll ask about that because I did raise that possibility but I didn't ask specifically about a study. So does either Will or Mark want to deal with it? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, the modelling has been done as part of Cycle Super Highway. So, if you, as part of the Cycle Super Highway information, there's some information on modelling which includes the impact of what's here and so on. So, it's so, part so of the what's process. missing, Mark, is any indication that it will improve air quality. Ah, I think this may be a, another matter. Okay, no, it's uh, not air quality, it will. I will come on to air quality, rest it's assured. It's another matter um, to talk about. I want to bring Andrew Potter in, who's sitting patiently to my immediate right, who's also a local cyclists as well, I think. Uh, Andrew, you've been looking at some of the modelling here. What conclusions do you come to? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, the first thing is, obviously, there's a lot. It's a very emotive area. The whole of cycling, we've, we've sort of got a bit sidetracked on behaviour of cyclists. That's not the, necessarily the issue. Um, what I started by doing was looking at traffic volumes and uh, cycling volumes as published by the Department of Transport for every place in London. And what I found was that actually the traffic on the High Road is not as high as it used to be back in 2009. Don't know why, but that's the statistics that's in the DOT uh, reports. Um, I also looked at cycling volumes in various roads and routes. Um, it gives you the average annual uh, daily volume and in the middle of Chiswick it's not 3,000 it's half of that. Now if you look at um, that's Department of Transport figures now if you look at other areas in London where there are super cycle super highways um, you, you actually have a multiple of that, those sorts of figures. Now that's not to say that it's a bad thing because I actually have cycled for 30 years I commuted for 10 years into Chiswick. Uh, I'm an experienced cyclist. I've also been knocked off, knocked off my bike three times, so I know the dangers involved. Um, so generally speaking, this scheme is quite complex. Um, I'm looking at it from a number of aspects. One, the impact on traffic. The modeling is in the, it, it is in the document, but it's a summary. It doesn't tell you how you got there. And my point about modelling, and anyone that lives in Chiswick, it's fine as long as everything's working. As soon as something doesn't work, what you get in Chiswick is absolute gridlock. So any slight change in traffic flows and, uh, and the way things are balanced can have a massive effect on Chiswick. Now the frequency of that occurs, I would be interested to know whether the modellers come up with any answers as to that possibility. Uh, thank you for raising that. Does everybody want to answer that directly? Well, um, I'm not an expert on, on modelling. Just coming back, I apologise. The, the 3,000, the, 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 the route in, in Chiswick, we've recorded a maximum, I think, of about 336 cyclists using <coughs> Chiswick High Road uh, on, a on a weekday at an AM peak, according to the, the most recent counts, which works out at about five or six cyclists a minute uh, on Wellesley Road, that's four or five uh, cyclists a minute. What we've also looked at is the predicted increases and obviously as I set out earlier, one of the objectives of the Mayor, one of the objectives of this is to increase the number of, of people cycling and enjoying cycling around our city. We've seen with other routes where you have provided that safe infrastructure, people using those routes more and, uh, and, and so in this case we're looking at a, a significant increase along that route. In terms of the modelling specifically, I'm going to again hand back to my colleagues at TfL because I'm not a traffic modeller. Uh, right, who of, who of the TfL uh, cluster would like to contribute? <laughs> yes, sir. Better tell us who you are, first of all. Well, 
it's, it's not going to be comfortable. Uh, good evening, everybody. Should we give it a go? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Kozinowski, but normally I'm going to be Dave, uh, make it easier. Uh, I am one of the TFL Chapter Control Engineers. Uh, my team has been responsible for producing the modelling that is available on the TFL consultation website. Um, I think most important point, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that already, uh, I'd strongly urge you to take a look at uh, details probably most of the questions that you've got here this evening. Um, to answer the point about capturing error or you know, what happens on a bad day, uh, the process that we've gone through in the modelling is a sort of build-up of what we think the future scenario or future base scenarios we refer to in TFL is going to be, which is high risk. So it's taking into account uh, general population growth in London, uh, committed planned and network projects in the area before we then see what the impact is of CS9 and we mitigate against that uh, in the future proposed scenario, um, which again, if you haven't seen the consultation table uh, on the consultation website, summarizes uh, the impacts on journey times. Um, obviously, modeling is only indicative and we cannot say for sure that what we have proposed will be the outcome. That's why we prefer to present our journey time assessments uh, in a banded form because it has a variability on the street. Um, basically, our modeling process uh, is very thorough. We use micro simulation modeling and also wider track reassignment modeling to try and summarize what we think will happen in the best case. Um, no perfect scenario can we account for daily, uh, daily fluctuation, but what we try to capture is the best profile okay. of the 2021 scenario. Um, do you want a quick response to that? Yeah, um, yeah I've got a couple of other points. Can people hear me? Yeah. Um, from a cycling or cyclist point of view, um, and it's interesting, I think, was it Paul at the end? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the points he made about the appropriateness of the scheme in various road types was very uh, poignant. Um, in my experience, the, uh, I, I think cycling on a two-way lane with so many junctions on a shopping street, uh, which as far as I can find out or, or assess, there is no cycle superhighway through any similar similar conurbation, village, street, whatever you want to call it. And what's going to happen is that when you're cycling with the volume of pedestrians we have in Chiswick, a lot of people come here, it's a destination, it's not a village, it's a destination where people come and shop. Um, it, it, that means that when you have a two-way system and pedestrians are trying to get across the cycling lane, they will look the way of the traffic, but not the opposite way. And I actually think it's extremely dangerous to have a two-way cycling uh, throughway in the middle of Chiswick. Because I want to pick that point up, Joy, with you, I think. Um, what is there in these proposals to keep pedestrians safe when they cross this supermarket? Okay, um, how's this mic doing? Am I audible? <laughs> question. Okay, um, so within this proposal there are various different things to keep pedestrians safe as they cross the cycle superhighway. All existing marked crossing points would remain as they are and some would be wider. I think it's probably important to note that there is not that much informal crossing of Chiswick High Road at the moment. So as you wouldn't step out and cross the you know, four lanes of traffic which are there for much of Chiswick High Road at the moment, equally you may not want to step out into the cycle track. Um, where there are marked crossing points, um, the cycle track would be level. So if you were in a wheelchair with a push chair, that kind of thing, you would not have to bump up and down a curve. Um, and at various points as well, it would be raised to give a clear indication that something is different here. There'd be a ramp for cyclists. Um, yet to encourage reasonable cycling speeds. Who has right of way? Sorry? Who has right of way? The question was who has right of way if you didn't hear it. Okay, yeah, sorry, um, my name's Alan, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, in terms of right of way, we are, at TFL, we've got into uh, detailed analysis of how, especially with buses, where the bus stops are, and the bus stop where uh, pedestrians are likely to cross the cycle superhighway to for a definite, a defined reason or purpose. At bus stops, parking bays, um, into their residential properties. We have clearly identified crossing areas, 
some that are aligned with existing locations where people are already cross in, and we are also adding additional crossing points along the route. Who has right of way? So, in the, the answer for who has right of way, we have done additional studies to find out what the best. So in terms of right of way, we have defined and um, determined that having the zebra type crossings will define that pedestrians have right of way at given locations at the bus stop. Yeah, depending on where you are. So on an uncontrolled crossing, yeah. of which where, um, and to be fair, most of the crossings, as far as I can see from the plans, are where they are at the moment. They've been slightly adjusted, but quite a few of them, many of them, in order to get to the final pavement, there is what's called, an, at the moment, an uncontrolled crossing. Um, that really worries me. It would worry me if I had children with me. Um, and I'm really unclear about, still, about, are you now saying that there will be a zebra crossing? At which point it is not uncontrolled, it is controlled because most of us can work on several crossing. But that moment when you are with increased cycling, and I'm not anti cycling whatsoever, but I am anti being, um, being um, the trepidation yeah. of getting from one side of the road where I live okay. to the other. Well, quick response. Yes. Hands. Agreed. I think what we need to think about is, is, is how we cross roads in, in general. Where there are where there are crossings that are either signalised or zebra crossings, that gives a very clear indication that uh, that gives the priority to the pedestrian, which would be the case where there are crossings across the district. Where there are not crossings, and maybe there's just a, 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 an island in the middle, then it is up to the pedestrian to look both ways and uh, make an assessment of, of crossing that road. So one of the, on this route, we are talking about, uh, because of the lights and the traffic lights along the route, the cyclists will be coming in waves of traffic. It won't be a, a, a continuous stream of constant tra uh, of, of cyclists bumping along here. They're going to be going through waves of five or six minutes. How, how do you know that? Because yeah, you can model, that. you can model the cycle flames as well as you model traffic. And if they have all lights, I think this is a this is a valid point. I think that uh, it is a it is a valid point. Ruth, a brief word on that because I know you said that. I've just been mirrored by the chair. Ruth, deal with the red light thing. I'm not going to dwell on it because I know it just goes round and round in circles. It does. But there is a concern. Uh, and you, we've all seen it happen yeah. when cyclists go through red lights. So what do you say? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a cyclist. I cycle and lots of people cycle. Oh, 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 well, we're not cyclists. First on a bicycle. I mean, the whole point of this is to get more people cycling and walking. I don't really want to go into the debate on it because there's many people drive, I don't know if any of you have crossed at A4 Sutton Court Road, eight, by eight vehicles go through the traffic lights every so long, every change, and there are lots of other accidents. It's high road, a lot of people drive through red, there are lots of accidents there, there which are statistically. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not an accident. They get They are not They are not They are They are not We'll never move on. You want to I want to say something. Going through red lights is illegal. It's yes. inappropriate for the highway road and, and it's reckless. This right. should not be condoned by cyclists or drivers or by anybody yeah. else. Thank Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly why there are people getting fined this very moment. I spoke to three people today who did actually pick up tickets for going through a red light on a bike. Okay. That is exactly what we need to do. It is, we shall not condone reckless behaviour by any road users, whether they're, whatever they're driving. David, you talked briefly. about this before. What I don't understand is you're telling us just because there's a cycle lane, suddenly there's going to be enforcement. Cyclists, good for all of you, are supposed to adhere to the rules of the road, and they don't. Forgive me, forgive me, I'm going to move it on. I have two. 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 I
And I moved back very recently, uh, about a month ago, into Chiswick, after two years in central London, using the cycle ways, the Santander bikes, and so on. Uh, I loved the Santander bike, uh, sorry, the routes, the cycle routes. I loved the way that the traffic lights for cycles meant that you stopped, you waited, and then you went when your, when your light was green. I found it, I, I agree with whoever the lady was who said that when you're a cyclist and there are children on the lane, you do slow down because everybody has that respect. Okay, not everybody. There's no context in which everybody has respect. But when I came back to Chiswick about six weeks ago, I have never been more frightened cycling in my life. There is no awareness of cycles. There is no space for them. I, I, I stopped cycling through Chiswick after cycling consistently in central London for years. And I think it's very easy to lose sight of what we're trying to achieve here by being distracted by the details of it. And of course the details are important. But let's not lose sight of what we're trying to achieve, which okay. is the pensioners yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Equally patient. So have your have your few moments, and then I'm going to move it on to some of the people sitting here. Yeah. Thank you. I've come here as a pedestrian purely. I'm not pro or anti cycle. I don't think that cars are more dangerous or bicycles more dangerous on the road. I am talking about the pavement. I have lived here 30 years. For the last sort of 28, I have a good walk going through Chiswick. I'm always walking in this area. But it's got a problem, more and more problematic, particularly in the last 18 months, because of the behaviour of cyclists on the pig. Right. They come fast. They force pavements, pedestrians to step aside. They come round corners of the rate of knots. I have been missed by a whisker three times in the last year alone, and the grandchild of acquaintances of mine was nearly killed by a cyclist. So what what I'm say? saying, wait. What you want is a segregated house. Wait. <laughs> Potentially of segregation in that case. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> what I am trying to point out to the cyclist organisations that I know their cyclists follow the rules. Sure. Unfortunately, we have many cyclists in this area okay. who do not. All right, I think that point has been made, and I just want to move it on. I want to get on to the business issues because we've got people here to talk specifically business. David is here as well, so I want to get some thoughts about business. Let me bring in, uh, sitting in here, Annette uh, Mayatsai, who's the owner of Chateau Desert, and many people will know that on yeah. the south side of the high road. Um, uh, perhaps a microphone can find you, with any luck. Yes, fine. Uh, just uh, reflections from your point of view, running a business on the south side of the high road. The south side, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The south side on Chiswick High Road is notoriously difficult. Um, the business rates increased this year, um, the parking restrictions and the hounding parking attendants um, on Chiswick High Road make it impossible. Um, now, as a business owner, the outside pavement space that I have is vitally important for me. Um, and I know in the documents it says that you uh, obviously you are not look, looking to lose any space for the pedestrians, which means the business as a business owner I will lose space from outside my business. Um, and for me that's a massive concern. And do you, do you know that? Do you know that for sure? So on the documents, um, I, I believe it identifies that. Um, well, first of all, Council of Highways identifies there has to be 1.5 metres clear away of zebra crossing or, or, or crossing of, um, of signal crossing before I can put my tables outside. Because I'm in the place where I am, there's going to be a signal crossing outside my property, um, which limits the amount of space that I'll be able to have. Because you have a zebra crossing very close. It's right up Yeah. So also the parking restrictions um, will mean that it will be more difficult for me to unload, deliver, have my de deliveries coming in. Um, so as much as I fully applaud um, the whole health side of things and the whole positive outlook for greener London, absolutely love that. But at the same time, I'm a business owner and it's a concern for me. Okay, David. 
bring, I wanted to bring you in at this point because that's one of your concerns. I think, um, what do you know of the impact that this would have on your business? In so far, uh, in, insofar as you have been consulted, um, oh, GFL hasn't contacted a single business that I've spoken to. They say that they have, but they haven't. Residents on the high road haven't been contacted. Residents on the side road, or Carolina and I are, haven't, haven't, been, con haven't been notified. Mm -hmm. When they do work on the district <coughs> line or whatever, everybody in town knows because everybody gets a yeah, picture of their It's going on now. No, but that's the consultation later. How did I find this place? By word of mouth. That's how I found this place. Can I come back to you on the TFL website? You have to know. I'm supposed to know. Just go on the TFL website. You're part of the community. 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 You're part of the that angle sort of yeah. had a form of Chiswick Lane. But what I can say about the loading is this. Go on. We have a loading bay just outside on Chiswick Lane. It's currently at the road level. And part of the scheme is to elevate it to the footpath level, which makes no sense to me whatsoever because it works fine just as it is. So it's people are going to die. They're going to die. People die. Uh, We're talking about the loading bay on Chiswick Lane. You're still How are they going to die? <laughs> Can we just get back to David's loading issues for a moment? I'm sorry, what? You're misunderstanding what you have. You just got it wrong. I'm sorry. No, I you will still, no, you will still be able to put goods vehicles onto your loading bay. Okay, so you've got the danger. You're the same. Is that raised? Same. They're raising no, it to the level. No, it will be a drop Read the TFL document. It says raise to put at level. In the end, you can put only the I think you can put the only the only I'm not going to go the whole scheme. I'm just going to just appeal at this point. If we get too bogged down in the scheme, we'll just have to move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 Y
They will be here before the 13th of October, so someone will be coming into your business to ask you about the requirements we're, for we're, the What businesses have you consulted with already? Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. consulted yeah. today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 can do without speaking directly to businesses because we know where your tables are. So on the high road there are two sides obviously on the north side there are no material changes to footway which businesses will be unaffected. On the south side there are six businesses which have outdoor seating, there's Shattered Search, there's Byron, there's Zizi's, there's three others whose names escape me under its heat. Um, Jackson and Rye is certainly <laughs> Yeah, um, so at every single one of these, there would remain enough space to have seating outside and for the football to pass outside of them. At five out of the six, the pavement width wouldn't change at all. Um, so the tables and footway would stay just as it is out there today, including Chateau Dessert. At the six, which is Byron, there would be a small footway cut back, but there would be more than enough space for people to pass, you know, two wheelchairs to get past with the tables to remain exactly as they are out there today. Very briefly, David, and then I'm going to The move one on. thing that's not shown on your drawings is where the bike racks will go. So once those bike racks are installed, and you take that measurement that you're talking about that's dictated by the council, it's going to reduce the amount of sidewalk pavement even more. Okay. Well, I'm going to move it on because I want to bring some other thoughts in. I want to talk about British growth. I'm saying uh, if there I want to bring in, I want to bring in another voice. David, apologies, but I want to bring some other voices in and some other concerns, and not at the moment. Esther Charkham, uh, I want to bring you in, if I may, to talk about British Road. Uh, where's Esther? In which case, somebody's waving excitedly yes, about yes, yes. Um, my apologies. Yes, yes. yes. British I've, Road. I've been wanting to ask, um, what is actually the status of, I don't know, what is the status of the consultation? Clearly, I think we haven't actually had very long, but what actually, what happens if, let's say, 95% of residents in Chiswick and business owners in Chiswick strongly oppose on, on the, the document? Does it still happen? Does the state just say, you're getting it, and it's coming through whatever you think, and this is a more a bit of a sham just to make us feel better, or maybe persuade us? I don't know. What is the actual status of the consultation? What's the legal status? How much notice do you take? And then second, second sort of part of the question is, clearly there is a huge amount of devil in the detail. That's why we get all these questions about British growth, businesses and stuff. So how much optionality is there to get the, get the thing right? Because it's hard to disagree with the big principles. But to look at all the very, very, very many points of detail in a pretty short time, because the consultation, as it's called, ends on the 30th of October. Uh, well, do you want to deal with that? And then I'm going to move it on to talk about the Catholic Church. How the, much yeah. are you really listening, both the, to the overview and the detail? That's well, the question. I wouldn't be giving up my time if we weren't listening. I think a lot of people in this room wouldn't be giving up the time. This point, the point around consultation is to understand concerns, how do we improve designs, I know that... So it can't be stopped, it's coming whatever, is that what you're saying? Is it a real consultation? Is it, is it coming whatever, but you might no, change a few things? No, it is not things. a done deal. It is okay. not a done deal. This is an opportunity really? to present plans to improve mm -hmm. cycling and walking for the communities along this road, <laughs> to drive, uh, to, to pursue the mass transport strategy, which again is up for consultation. The whole point of this is to understand people's concerns, reflect is this, is this something that we need to look at more radically in terms of the changes that are, that are required, is this something where we need to go into more detail. Uh, the team have been out talking to businesses, uh, we've, I know the team have been in British Grove today talking today, to... Today, two weeks before the end of the, the consultation, consultation. You how can you say it's real? <laughs> is that a real consultation? You start talking to weeks. Two weeks. But this much of detail that you have to The detail. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two it's not yeah. real. Can I, can I just, can I just stick, real stick, stick to this issue about the fact that it's not a done deal? So this could not. There is a distinct possibility here today that what we've talked about this evening won't happen. There is. This is absolutely not a done deal. This a consultation means doing a consultation. No decisions have been made to proceed with the screen with the scheme. We need to review the feedback. We need to understand what people's concerns are. We need to see if we can improve it. 
This is not a referendum. Well, referendums are not binding either. <laughs> This is not a vote on the scheme, this is understanding what people think of it, this is how we improve it, this is how we maybe review the whole thing if people, if, if, if there are really significant concerns in it. Right. That is why we're here today, that is why there are other events happening, that is why people are going door to door. The consultation finishes on the, uh, on the 31st of October. If people, if people feel that they, uh, they, they need more time to comply with responses, we can consider some of those late responses. But this is about listening to concern. And I, I, should say, I should say on that subject that I know uh, Joy said to me earlier on today that they will be around once we finish the sort of formalities of this uh, to answer further questions. And I don't want to um, uh, until that was done. So um, I need to get moving in that case. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Matt. Um, Cheers, Akish, on Twitter if anyone knows me. Um, I um, speak with two hats on. One is uh, Chiswick High Road Action Group, um, who are neither opposed nor usually supportive of the uh, plans. Um, and two, my own personal um, objection that I'm going to be making. Um, so I uh, can tick everyone's boxes. I live on the corner of British Grove, I live on Chiswick High Road, I run a business from the building, and I live there, and you're reducing the payment by three quarters. I don't really care about any of that stuff. What I really care about is I'm going to be living here for 50 years. That's my aim. I own a home there, and I love the area to bits. The thing that I care about, and what I'd like to ask you, Dr. Norman, is in what way... Uh, so you are the Commissioner for uh, Cycling and Walking, is that correct? So I think the Mayor's Draft Transport Strategy 2017 talks about, uh, it headlines the issue of reducing traffic and increasing pedestrian and cycling. Well, I think that's fabulous, and I'm really all for it, but Cycle Lane uh, number nine, Cycle Super Highway number nine, doesn't do that. What it does is it takes from pedestrians and it gives to cyclists. Can you tell me how CS9 is actually, what it's going to be doing to reduce traffic on Chiswick High Road, because as a resident, as a business owner, and as someone who cycles, you know, there are idiots who cycle, there are idiots who drive. I try to be a nice person who drives and cycles. I love long distance cycling, I love short distance cycling, I love the whole okay. lot. But can you tell me what CS9 is actually doing to reduce cars on the road? Briefly, I spoke, briefly, I'm, just briefly, can, I just, can I just put that yeah, point to Will? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Briefly, briefly. <laughs> Highway 9 is about providing quality infrastructure that will allow people to make the most shift out of their cars, reducing traffic by not using the cars, by providing alternative options such as cycling through this area. Uh, there was a gentleman over here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I've got to come back on you, 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 Your stated aims, the Mayor's stated aims, and you are the Cycling and Walking Commissioner, his stated aims are to reduce, his headline aims are to reduce cars. What, what, what is this going to This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reduce cars on Chiswick High Road. We'd like to see cars reduced because I don't want to die of pollution no, when okay, I'm sick. So, please, what is it doing to Chiswick High Road? As I said earlier, the, the, the main headline of the Mayor's Transport Strategy is about mode shift. It is driving 64% of journeys by walking, cycling, and public transport as it stands at the moment to 80% of people walking, cycling, so and So why are you taking people, from the Reducing, <coughs> reducing, yes. reducing. Why are you reducing? taking from the pavement? But if, if the pavement why is going to be reducing in size, that reduces the incentive for pedestrians to go about their business, does it not? There, there, we are not doing anything to endanger pedestrians. Yes, you are. You are reducing. No, 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 no. In some places, no, no, no. the pavement will be smaller than it is now. That is not putting anyone at risk. It's not quite the same point, though, is it? Is this making it more dangerous for the But what are you doing to reduce cars on the road? Why are you not making it more dangerous? Hold on, 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 hold I love this as well. Coming here, what I noticed was, was coming from the super highway, I had to ride through um, Kensington and Chelsea and Hansford and Golden. So, I mean, the scheme looks good, but in isolation, to actually get to Chiswick from the city, which is what I did, I had, you know, close past. Once I got into Kensington and Chelsea, there were no advanced stop zones. There seems to be a lot of inconsistencies 
in how you're going. In, if you can build it here, it's linking it up to the rest of the city going east. And I think it's going to okay. be um, the problem. Ruth, very briefly, then I will come to the Catholic Church. Well, very briefly, the issue with Kensington Chelsea is that Kensington Chelsea as a borough resolutely refused to allow any cycle lanes going through there. So that's yeah. held up CS9 for a very long time. And the point now is that CS9 will go to Olympia and then hopefully the weight of the number of people cycling will do that. You say about a um, thing, I mean, I remember in 1989, when CPZ first came and a woman stood up and said, isn't it going to be shocking, isn't it dreadful in the Silver Crescent? But actually it came and it's come bit by bit by bit by bit and eventually it has to come to all of us because basically you can't just drive around. Right. I'm the going... Hobart Health Club is now charging for parking and a lot of the driving along the high road during the day is people who come from where I live by Governorsville Station to the Hobart Health Club, which increases the amount okay. of driving. Once people walk, cycle, take the tube, then it will be much better. Ruth, let me bring some other voices in who are being asked to come specifically. <laughs> to, uh, before we end the debate. John Barber is from the uh, uh, Lady of Grace Catholic Church. Uh, John, a word from you about your concerns. Good evening. My name is John Barber. I'm a member of the congregation of Our Lady of Grace. Our church has been there for 165 years, and it's a very important part of the community of Chiswick. Um, on any, any weekend, the average mass attendance is of 1,405 people, and if you multiply that over the year, that's 73,000 people movements, and that's just at the weekends. There are six masses on a Saturday and a Sunday, and outside mass before going into Mass, coming out of Mass, there are upwards of 400 people on the pavement outside the church. And they drive. <laughs> on the pavement outside the church. And the proposal is to remove two-thirds of the pavement from immediately in front of the church. And that's going to leave us with not very much space at all. And given that there are going to be two lanes of cyclists going right in front of the church, our fear is that it's not going to be safe. On a Sunday. On a Sunday. And on a Saturday evening. Our fear is that it's not going to be safe. If there were to be an emergency evacuation out of the church, 400 people could not... The How many times has that happened? Can I, can I just come back with a question? Uh, um, there are those who would argue that quite a lot of of those concerns could be resolved if you made more use of the Duke's Avenue entrance mm -hmm. to the yeah. church, which has been aired by some in this debate. How do you respond to that specific point? The Duke's Avenue entrance to the church is not anything like the same width as the main entrance to the church. The church can't be redesigned just to accommodate these proposals. Julian, can I come in? Yeah, well, yeah. So, uh, John, thanks, thanks for coming and thanks for, for making the point. I, I know that uh, this has been a particularly heated issue, and I think one of, one of the things I really want to encourage is just that we can calm, calm this whole thing down. I know there's some, some particularly sort of offensive trolling on social media and a raft of other things, uh, which I don't want to, in any way that we, we can condone. I know, I actually really think it's very positive that the church has engaged with us. As I said earlier, this is a consultation. We're, we're looking at things. I know the team, a week after, that, within a week of that uh, uh, the issue being raised, have spoken to Father Dan, Father Dan I think, uh, and I think that we're having a productive conversation around that. As I said, this is not a done deal. This is exactly why we want okay. to. But I would just argue, or I just urge everybody just to calm down, and, and the offensive behaviour going backwards and forwards on some of these issues doesn't help anyone in terms of furthering debate. I want to bring in um, Vanessa Costello as well. Uh, Vanessa is Chair of Southfield Conservatives. Vanessa, you're here. Uh, you'll need my microphone. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, I'm absolutely staggered at the amount of expectations that we're hearing tonight. I think, um, realistically, they're unrealistic. And I want to tell you about some of the research that I've done. I know that everybody here in this little group has worked very hard looking at various aspects. And I looked at the consultation document in particular because it actually seemed too good to be true. And I think it is too good to be true. I think it's 
it's cranked up as Will, uh, forgive me, Commissioner, you were introduced as Will, so... No, Will, 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 fine. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. uh, uh, as Will said, it's wrapped up with the Mayor's vision. And I, and I know a lot of people that have had visions, and very few of them come true, to be honest. Um, it, it is nothing more than a vision. It's based on a healthy streets strategy. I have a strategy. My husband has a strategy. You know, we, it's a strategy. So I thought, let's have a look back at the evidence. And I was quite concerned when I started to look into um, what's backing up these prices. This is, this is a magic bullet. Why should any of us not want this? This is going to change our lives completely and solve all of our problems. To answer the gentleman, she's wicked. She's wicked. She's wicked. You say it. But, um, he, he, he's absolutely right. How is this going to take cars off the road? It's not going to take cars off the road. Because if this manages to double, UK cycling levels, it would take about 3% of the talking nationally of cars off the road. And, and it, it, it would take about 3% of cars off the road if we managed to double our cycling levels now. But can I just very quickly Brief tell you, yep. um, I, 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 in, in last year, the Department for Transport realized that they had a gap in their guidance for evaluating cycle infrastructure and they commissioned a company, a Finnish company called uh, Technopolis to prepare a huge report. If anybody wants to contact me, I can show you where to find that report. Now that report uh, it, it is very thorough, it's independent. It's not a transport for London report or evaluation. And it will tell you one thing that hasn't been mentioned tonight, displacement. Displacement affects footfall as well as footfall as well as cars. The only thing that will tackle uh, pollution and clean the air, which is the high road, is going to be infrastructure that targets the congestion, not a cycle. Can we finish by talking about air pollution? Because it was raised earlier on. We haven't gone there very much. What do you say that you know from your various modelling uh, that will emerge in air pollution statistics as a result of this? Um, I can come on to that. I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things. that We are talking about London rather than a national perspective, and, and I think we need to focus on the London data rather than the national data. We have seen a 100% increase, over a 100% increase in cycling in London. Uh, uh, since 2005, and in central London, where there's been a considerable investment in infrastructure, we've seen a 200% increase in cycling, over a 53% reduction in motor car use. So that does show that when you invest in the infrastructure, you do see that change. In terms of displacement, this has been reflected all around the world. There's a study that I was reading um, a few weeks ago that showed in 11 different countries, in 70 different cycling schemes, you saw traffic not being displaced, but traffic leaving that scheme, seeing it, it, it disappear. You're seeing that an, an average of 11% traffic uh, 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 disappearing of that. In London, we've got our own data that shows that that's higher in some er in areas of, uh, of Waltham Forest, where you've seen some of the infrastructure go in. We've seen a change of up to 56% uh, reduction in some of the residential roads. So we do have the evidence that shows that these schemes do reduce car use, they do increase cycling, and they do increase people's health. So okay. I think that's absolutely critical. Can you it tackle is a vision, but it's a vision that has a that has that, that this is an action that helps deliver that vision. And without action, the vision, as I agree with you, a vision is nothing. Can you deal with the air pollution? Right, thank you. So in, terms of, uh, in terms of air pollution, uh, a, the, we will be carrying out environmental monitoring and evaluation well, on, the, uh, on, on, on that. I think air pollution, it is, it, this is a, a London-wide. The other day we got affected by air pollution coming from France, let alone uh, what's going on in, in a single area. This has to be a strategic <laughs> issue across London. Increasing cycling, reducing motor traffic in London is part of that, 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 that apart. but that's not enough, and I would agree with you that that's not enough. 
Some of the other things that we're doing, and this is going to affect Chiswick directly, is putting in the low emission buses, which uh, by 2020, that will be every bus switched to a low emission model that goes up and down this road. That will help reduce that, uh, that air pollution. We're putting in uh, reducing the emissions from taxis and private hire vehicles. We're putting in rapid, uh, uh, rapid charging points. We're putting in the, the next week, we've got a T-charge coming into London, which charges people with the most polluting vehicles coming in to reduce that pollution. That will evolve into the ultra low emission zone. We have a system of measures of which key to that is driving <coughs> bikes don't cause air pollution. Most of you <coughs> Using diesel and petrol cause air pollution in our city. That is what we need to change, and that is why this is part of that strategy. Right. Sorry, did you say, uh, did you uh, say uh, you've uh, done uh, the modelling, or you will do the modelling? Uh, what I'm going to do have you done the, No, but has he done the pollution modelling, or have you, well, has are the you pollution going modelling to you're going to do? We need, we need to monitor it. the effects of this scheme, but in terms but of you individual schemes... What the impact would be. But that's only after yeah. it's in place. Yeah, surely you've impacted it before, like you've done with the traffic and other things. Well, yeah. this is a very different kind of question. But hearing everything, and I love the fact that people still have passion. A thought. We are a city that has probably one of the most expensive public transports in the world. So, if we're talking about taking traffic off at the volumes of a city of our size, I am not so sure or confident that the cycle, I am agreeing with cycling, I, I, I love it, I do it. By the way, it's, I'm talking about children on the pavements, not adults. So give me a yeah, you are, make that point. But here's, here's the thing. If we reduce the cost of public transport, I love cycling, but I also take trans public transport, do you think that that might have an effect on uh, people who may come off cycle and use public transport more? Because London is very expensive to live. Cycling is a very good, healthy, but cheap form of transport. If we reduce public transport and make it more accessible to these people who recycle, just a thought, do you think that will have a bigger effect on reducing traffic? I'm going to make one. I'm going to make. Let me just say before we, before we do that, I'm going to make that the last question, if I may. But go on. With. That's exactly what we. The mayor froze the fares over over the period, which is re effectively reducing the price. We're given. What are we? Inflation's going up at what level? Why not stop the Piccadilly line at Turning Green? And also... <laughs> 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 same cost within that time is absolutely critical but this is about making this accessible for all London. Right yeah. I'm going to call it I'm going to call things to a halt at this point for several reasons one is that I'm due to um, <laughs> the other is that there are members of, of Will's team who are here and who are able to talk to you individually because clearly there are lots of other things that people want to air and we haven't had time uh, I want to remind you that to see this you can go to the Chiswick calendar website uh, and I want to thank uh, Bridget, who's sitting behind me, for uh, enabling that to happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, on, on all of your behalf, so I want to thank uh, Will and Ruth and Caroline and David for taking part uh, this evening. Um, thank you very much.